Praise the Lord. God has given us power. God has given me power. God has given you glory. God has given you strength. You will never be the same again. Everything that troubled you in the past, they are crushed and crumbled. I have power. I have power. I have power. Your weakness is gone in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your gift. Thank you for the power. Thank you for everything you have given us. Lord, we pray we we'll live and be victorious in this power in Jesus' name. Lord, there will be no exception. From the least to the greatest. From the lowest of us to the highest. From one side to the other. We'll feel your power today. Sense your power today. And live in your power today. I will pray, Lord, everything that conquered us before, we will conquer. We give you the glory. We rejoice. We live. And we are going to abide in this great, unconquerable power you have given to everyone. Amen. Confirm it in every life, Lord. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You can sit down. We are coming to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. I am reading from verse 4. Therefore, we are buried with sin by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. It's raised up. It's risen. And it brings resurrection power into your life, into my life. It brings that resurrection power to the church. It brings the resurrection power to the leaders in the church. It brings that resurrection power to every member of the church, to the Christian. And it says now, because of that resurrection power that he now transfers into your life, into my life, we should live in walk in newness of life. In verse 5, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. We will be in the likeness of his resurrection. When he rose up from the dead, there was no pressure or power or pilotage of Herod, of Caiaphas, over him. And we should walk in the likeness of his resurrection. Every negative power has dropped away from your life. Every encumbrance has dropped away from your life. And the remembrance of the past and the remembrance of everything that was defeat and failure and weakness, they are gone in Jesus' name. We're now living, we're now moving, we're now walking in the likeness of his resurrection. Look at this, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Our old man is crucified with him. I want you to picture in your heart an old man, an old tyrant, an old oppressor. An old person that always forced you, always dragged you and said, come. And you cannot resist. Bend down. You cannot resist. Stand up. You cannot resist. Go and take that dirty thing. You cannot resist. Carry it on your head. You cannot resist. That old man 
so powerful a tyrant. And he said, drink this. Although you know it is not, it's not good to drink, but you couldn't resist. You could drink. But now that old man, picture him, is crucified. I said he's crucified. He feels so much pain. He, does, he doesn't have mouth to talk and command you and to force you. That old man will not force you anymore. Actually, that old man is the natural man. That old man is the power of Adam inside you. That old man is the one control was the one controlling your life. The old man is now crucified. Crucified was he, that the body of sin might be destroyed. He was the generator of sin, the origin of sin, the source of sin, the nucleus of sin, the kernel of sin. He was the power behind every temptation in your life. And now that body of sin will be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. This time we're talking about walking in his resurrection power. You have that power already. You sense that power already. And you believe in that power already. Resurrection power. And that power will make you walk on every sea. Will make you fly over every mountain. Will make you jump over every hurdle. And will make you overcome in every trial, temptation, battle of your life in Jesus' name. Walking in his resurrection power. So the things we're looking at. Number one, the call to walk in newness of life. The call to walk. In newness of life, you must know your calling. If you know your calling, you'll not be sidetracked. If you know your calling, you'll not be taken to another place where you're not supposed to be. He calls you to walk in newness of life. If any invitation comes, come walk in this way. That's not my calling. That's not newness of life. Come, join us, and move in this direction. I'm sorry, that's not my calling. I know my calling. He has called us to walk in newness of life. Number two, our consecration, our commitment, our devotedness, our consecration to walk in newness of life. Now we are people of one direction. And people of one goal. And people of one purpose. And people of one commitment. And people of one force and might. And we consecrate our lives to walk in newness of life. Number three, the crowning. There's going to be a crown for you. I said there's going to be a crown for you. He said the crowning for walking in newness of life. Even in this life, the Lord will crown you. In the life to come, the Lord will crown you. Reward. You turn to the right, there will be reward for you. To the left, there will be reward for you. In your place of work, there will be reward for you. And then when you leave this world and you go to the great beyond, there will be a reward for you in Jesus' name. You will not serve God in vain. You have joy in serving God. Reward in serving God. Blessings in serving God. Our crowning for walking in newness of life. Number one. The call to walk in newness of life. Immediately we are saved. Immediately we turn to the Lord. Immediately all our sins have been confessed. We have repented of our sins. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Condemnation is gone. 
and the sinful, the guilt for sins of the past, all gone, a call comes to us that now that you are forgiven, now that you are saved, now that you are a child of God, look at the call, John chapter 8, verse 11. John chapter 8, verse 11. The call to walk in newness of life. Verse 11, she said, No, my Lord, the Lord had asked a question. It says, Woman, where are those non accusers? Has no man condemned thee after your forgiveness? No condemnation again. Your conscience cannot rightly condemn you again. You're forgiven. Your neighbors, husband or wife, cannot condemn you again. You are forgiven. And the people who were seen partners before, even though they are not born again on their own, but you are now born again, they cannot condemn you anymore because you are born again. And then all the people that used to know, you were down there. You are terrible. You are defiled. You are this. You are that. They cannot condemn you anymore. Your sins are forgiven. Satan cannot condemn you anymore because your sins are forgiven. The Almighty God will not condemn you, will not punish you anymore because your sins are forgiven. It says, neither do I condemn thee. Neither do I condemn thee. All condemnation is gone in Jesus' name. Now it says, go and sin no more. A new life has begun. I were to walk in the newness of that new life. Look at verse 12. Then speak Jesus again to them, not just to her, to them, all them that believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me, shall not walk in darkness. Things are different now. A new life has come. And he that followeth me, and she that followeth me, and they that follow me, shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. That's her calling. That's her calling. We're called to walk in newness of life. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and I'm reading from verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ. Christ in you, and you in Christ. When you came to Christ, all the sins you confessed, all the sins you repented of, they were blotted away. There is no remembrance of them anymore. And it says, for those who are now in Christ, there's no condemnation who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And in the old time, in the past, you were walking after the flesh. But now, regeneration has taken place. Salvation has taken place. You have repented. You have acknowledged your sin. You have confessed that sin. You have turned away from the sin. And you have separated yourself from that sin. It says now, you are no more walking after the flesh. You are walking after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free. Made me free made me free all those chains that were tied around you broken you're free the force of the devil that will compel you to carry a load that is not yours now you are free and the power of satan and the power of the flesh that will force you do that terrible sin, defiling sin. They cannot compel you anymore. You're free. I am free. 
has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Righteousness is not fulfilled. Fulfilled in the believer. Look at this. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Walk not, not after the flesh, but after the spirit. What does that mean? Galatians chapter 5, from verse 19. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Not walking after the flesh. What does that mean? Verse 19, Galatians chapter 5. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Not walking after the flesh. These are the things. Not walking after an adulterous life anymore. Adultery. Not walking after the flesh. No more fornication. Not walking after the flesh. No more uncleanness. Unclean dressing. Unclean language. Unclean behavior. Unclean dancing. Unclean activities, all that is gone from your life, from my life, our lives, in Jesus' name. Not walking after the flesh, not walking after lasciviousness. Verse 20, not walking after the flesh, idolatry. Not walking after witchcraft, not walking after occultism, no more belonging to any gang. And no more sorcery, not walking after the flesh, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, anger, fighting, violence, not walking after strife, not walking after seditions, not walking after heresies, false doctrine, not walking after envies, jealousy, murders, abortion, not walking after drunkenness, not walking after revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I will inherit the kingdom of God. But he says, and now walking after the Spirit, what does that mean? Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. We're not walking in love. You see a fellow brother, and your action to that brother is dictated by pure love. You see a fellow sister, and your action towards that sister is pure love. You see a child, and your action towards that child is born out of sympathetic love. You see the sick and your action towards that sick is born out of caring love. You see a stranger, a sinner and your action towards sin, towards her is born out of gospel love. We're now walking after love and joy and joy. We're not concentrating on what makes us sad. Many times when something happens that may not be pleasant, we forget 99 other pleasant things in our lives because of only one unpleasant thing. And because of that one single solitary unpleasant thing, we forget all the other 99 things about God being our Father and Jesus our Savior, and the Holy Ghost our Comforter, 
and the Bible, the light that has been given to us, and the joy of our salvation, and a place in heaven, and the glory of God, and the miracles we have got, and every good thing in our lives. Because of one solitary sin that makes us unhappy, we forget 99 things that give, gives us joy. But now we're walking in the spirit and we're concentrating on happiness and joy. I have joy today. I have happiness today. I commit myself. I'm hearing you now. To think about 99 joyful things in my life. Rather than one little single unpleasant thing in my life. And so we're walking in the spirit, we're walking in love. We walk in joy and we walk in peace. In our heart, there is peace. In our family, there is peace. In our way, there is peace. And the one that is reigning in our heart is the Prince of Peace. And anywhere we go, we are peacemakers today. You'll be a peacemaker. And long suffering, long suffering, what that means is there are times there's a little pebble in your shoe. There are times there's a little sand inside your shoe and you are walking. But then the place you are going is more important than that grain of sand. But then the joy you have and the work you're doing is more important than that grain of sand. And your destiny, your destiny is higher, is greater, more important than that little grain of sand. Therefore, you overlook that grain of sand. And you keep on walking. And I keep on walking. And I keep on walking. And you have long suffering. And you're walking in gentleness. You're walking in gentleness. And you're gentle with people all around you. Even those uh, who you might think, why should I be gentle to him? is going through a lot of things in his life. And everybody is harsh with him. Everybody is harsh on him. And everybody is giving him trouble. And you will be the only one that will change the course and the direction of his life. You will walk in gentleness. People are discouraged. People are downtrodden. People are suffering. Even some people are contemplating suicide. And you come along. You don't know what they're going through. And you say, I will lift him up by my gentleness. Your life will lift up people. And goodness, you will be good. After all, if you are carrying a bowl of water and it spills out, only water will spill out. Acid will not spill out if you're carrying a bowl of water and somebody just pushed you a little and the liquid inside your bowl that you are carrying spills out. You see, many people, they don't understand they're carrying the container of the goodness of Christ, the goodness of God. If anybody pushes you, if anybody makes you trip, what will come out of your mouth, of your life, will be goodness in Jesus' name. And faith, and meekness, and temperance, against such, there is no law. That's what we're walking on now. We're not walking in the flesh anymore. We're walking in the spirit. And let's look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, the call, here is a calling to walk in newness of life. Look at verse 1, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, as precious children, as beloved children, be followers of God. You're walking in life, and number one, you want the smile of God over your life. 
You want the favor of God over your life. You want the well done of God over your life. And you remember, he listens to every conversation. You remember, he sees every action. You remember, he knows the thoughts of your heart. And you want to win his smile and his favor. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear, beloved, precious children. And walk in love. And walk in love. No more hatred. And walk in love. No more retaliation. And walk in love. No more oppressing any other one. And walk in love. That's the newness of life. That he wants us to walk in and walk in love as Christ also has loved us. Always thinking about the love of God, the love of God, the love of God, and the love of Christ. Walk in love as Christ has loved us. How did Christ love us? When we were unlovable, when we were bad, when we were evil, he said, you will not perish. You must be saved. And he bestowed his love upon us as Christ has loved us when we were unlovable. You are not waiting for your brother to qualify, even though he's unlovable, because you don't like this, you don't like that. Walk in love as Christ has loved us. Maybe there are things you are doing before this time, and Christ did not like those things. You're born again. You're my child. I paid a great price for you. I washed you. I wrote your name in the book of life. Look at this thing you're doing, Peter. I don't like this. Taking your net, going back to the seaside, and wanting to catch fish, Abandoning what the Lord has called you to do, Peter. I don't like this, but I love you anyhow. And he went to them and he said, Children, have you any meat? They said, No. He said, Cast your nets there. I don't like what you're doing, but I love you. I will make you succeed. And he caught a lot of fish. And he said, Peter, Simon, Peter. I love you, but tell me, lovest thou me more than these? If the Lord has loved you, in spite of some things you have done that he didn't like, he said, in that same love of Christ, that you will love the unlikable. You will love every brother, every sister, as the Lord has loved you. You will walk in love. I will walk in love. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for his sweet smelling savor. You will love. You will love your wife. You will love your husband. I don't like what she does. Not every time, once in a while, one thing uh, out of a hundred things, love her, love him, love your fellow brother, love your fellow sister, because now this is our calling to walk in love, to walk in newness of life. We're coming to First John chapter 1, First John chapter 1. Verse 5, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light. You will walk in the light. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. With him is no deception at all. With him is no hidden sin at all. With him is no secrecy at all. Look up here. He wants us to walk like God. And with him is light. 
And we see him, it's no darkness at all. When you talk, talk as if everything you are saying is going to be transmitted over the radio. That everyone, including the person you are talking about, will hear over the radio. No secrecy, no covering up. It's in the light, it's in no darkness at all. Every action of your life, act as if everything will be televised. And everybody, the people who are looking for a fault in your life, and the people who are looking for something to grab, to say, uh-huh, he has done that. It's not fit to be a pastor. He has done that. It's not fit to be an overseer. He has done that. It's not fit to be a worker. He has done that. It's not fit to be a member of the body of Christ. Act as if every action will be televised for everybody to see. There are people that oppose you. And there are people that oppose your church. If your church is deep alive, there are people that oppose you for being in deep alive. Every statement you make, everything you sign, every work you do, anything that comes out of your life, make it as if all those people don't like me and they're looking for a fault and they're looking for something. They're going to read this in the newspaper. Act as if. Every action of yours will come out on the front page of the newspaper the following day. If you act like that, if you walk like that, you will not walk in darkness. You will not walk in hypocrisy. You will not walk in pretense. You will not walk in deception. You will walk in the light. I will walk in the light. I will walk in the light. Now you understand, even though it may not be written on the first page of the newspaper, it, it may not be transmitted over the radio, and it may not be viewed over the television. But you know, Jesus said, everything we say, everything we do will be brought up on the housetop. Everything we say in the dark. Everything we say is secret. On the final day, everybody will view it as if they are viewing a playback on the television set. Therefore, you want to walk in newness of life. Look at verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and, not, and do not the truth. If we say, that applies to preachers quite a lot. We're preachers, and when we preach, we preach with confidence. And we preach with uh, authority. And we preach on purpose. And we preach as if everything we're reading out is manifested in our life. We talk about the wife. And we talk about the husband. And we paint a good picture. And we paint a bright picture of the husband, of the wife, of the member, of the minister. That's how we talk. How preachers talk. Now we preachers. If we say we have fellowship with him. And on the basis of the assumption of fellowship with him. That's why we're preaching. If we walk in darkness, we we'll lie and do not the truth. And everyone who is a member of the living Bible, believing church, acts and talks as if, don't you know me? I'm a member of a Bible, believing church. Every brother, every sister, we testify. We have fellowship with God. We have fellowship with Christ. We have fellowship with the people of God. Ah, if we say we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, we lie, 
and do not the truth. But, verse 7, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, look at that. If we walk in the light, as who is in the light? Tell me, as who is in the light? As Christ our Savior. We don't say, there was one time Abraham had challenge, and then he said this, and we use that as excuse to tell lies. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, there was a time David was overtaken by his weakness, and he saw what he shouldn't have seen. And he followed up on seeing what he shouldn't have seen. And he went into disgrace and degradation. And we shouldn't say, David did that, so I can. No, you cannot. If we walk in the light, as he Christ is in the light. You remember Peter? And then there was a time his weakness got the better part of him. He was afraid unnecessarily. A little maid said, you are one of them. And he said, no, I am not. Another person came and said, even your speech betrays you. He began to curse. Now you cannot say, Peter did that at that time. Therefore, I can. No, you cannot. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, there are times the people cannot do something, but they want that thing done. And a higher authority tells them, commands them, compels them, Solomon, I am going the way of all men. You remember what she may did and said against me. I couldn't touch him because I opened my mouth and I said, leave him alone. Maybe God will look at his curse and then he'll get me out of this predicament. But Solomon, use your wisdom. Catch that man. Crush that man. Don't let him die in peace. Solomon was being commanded and compelled by another one, a figure, an authority figure in his life. Solomon, that's not the end. There is that man called Joab. I couldn't touch him because he was a militant and military man. Even though I'm a military man myself as king, and I killed Goliath, these sons of Zeruiah are too hard for me. I can't touch them, but you must kill that man. There are times when authority figures like that in your life, in your village, in your locality, they will say, I can't do it, but do it. And some people, they walk and they follow after the example of those authority figures. No, David was not walking in the light when he was saying all that. And Solomon was not walking in the light when he used God-given wisdom to do what is against walking in the light. We will not walk like any of them. Nobody will compel you to walk in darkness. You're free. In your mind, you're free. In your conscience, you're free. In your Christian life, you're free. You will not be a slave to Satan. You will not be a slave to sin. You will not be a slave to an authority figure in any of your lives in Jesus' name. At there are times the husband will talk to the wife and say, come on, my wife, before we got married, 
our family doesn't talk to that family. So, now that we are married to me, be very careful. Don't talk to any of them. Don't help any of them. You see, that's compelling somebody to carry your hatred. A wife saying, my husband, you know what? I was so surprised. Such and such, so and so, in the church, does not respect me. And see what he said about me. And see what she did to me. And you know, my husband, I don't have power to do anything and to retaliate. But you're my husband, you have power, you have authority. Do this to him, do this to her. Nobody will compel you to carry their dirty refuse in Jesus' name. I will not walk under the compulsion of a wicked man, a wicked woman. I am free. Somebody there, I am free. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, what does he do? Cleanses us from all sin. No sin will remain in your life. The call to walk in newness of life. Number two now. Our consecration. Our consecration to walk in newness of life. You know what? Every good thing happens in life by consecration. You want to be a good student? You have to consecrate. To be a good student, you'll find other people, you'll see other students roaming about, and they concentrate on street football playing, and they concentrate on street television watching, and they concentrate on gambling. But you want to be a successful academic boy or girl, it takes devotion. It takes consecration. You want to do well in business. You'll find people that try to cut corners. You'll find people that try to gamble. You'll find people that put their money in a place they think a hundredfold will come out. And they have lost everything. It takes consecration and commitment to be a good person in life. And now when you come into the gospel and you become a child of God and you begin to have some dreams. I want to be like Enoch who walked with God. I want to be like Elijah who brought the fire down. I want to be like Paul who went about and was successful in ministry. It takes a commitment. And every time you sing that chorus, I want to be another Elijah today. I pray God will confirm it in your life in Jesus' name. But you know, it takes diligence. It takes determination. It takes vision. It takes something you see afar off and you say, I am going to be like that. You'll be like that. You'll be improving every day. You'll be climbing up every day. But you know, it's going to take consecration. It's going to take dedication. And it's going to take diligence. You will not be lazy. It will be done. It will be done. It will be done. Is it impossible for God to raise Another Elijah today? Is it impossible for God to raise another Deborah today? I can't hear my sisters. Is it impossible to raise another Philip, another Stephen today? Is it impossible to raise another Paul today? To raise another Martin Luther today? Or to raise another John Wesley today, have a vision. Have a vision. And consecrate. 
yourself to walk in newness of life. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians 2, let me back up to verse 18. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. If I build again the things which I once destroyed, you remember in your life, if it was laziness, you conquered that laziness. Don't build up laziness again. You conquered idleness. Don't build up idleness again. You conquered being a riffraff, being a nonentity, being a nobody. And by the grace of God now, the kingdom of God is counting on you. You are important to God. Give me a good amen. amen. You are called to do something in the kingdom that no other person will do. Nobody will take your place. And what you are built up. The people knew you for. If I build again the things which I once destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. The worldliness you have destroyed in the past, you will not build it up. The carelessness you have destroyed in the past, you will not build it up. And now that you are known for somebody who is called, as somebody who is called of God, and you are moving on, moving on to perfection, you will not go back to imperfection in Jesus' name. Look at verse 20 now. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. You are a child of God. Christ lives in you. You believe in sanctification. Christ lives prominent in your life. And you believe in holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Praise the Lord. You are one of the faithful few in this world. Christ liveth in you. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the face of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Any amen coming from there? Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 1. It says, And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, when Abram was 99 years of age, remember, he was called, he responded, he came into the new life at the age of 75. From 75 to 99, 24 years. 24 years after his coming into the calling of the new life. Now the Lord said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. All the imperfections that were still there, after 24 years of conversion, clear it up. Don't say it is too late. They say a fool at 40 is a fool forever. I've been carrying on like this for the last 99 years. There's no hope. There is no change. No, there's going to be a change. What the Lord has ordained for your life. The ladder he has called you to climb, you will climb it in Jesus' name. At 99, the Almighty God said, get rid of the imperfections. Get rid of the deception. Get rid of walking up and down. Get rid of instability. And get rid of any form of corruption that may still be remaining there. 
get rid of any remnant of what should not be there. Here is your consecration now. I will walk before the Lord. I will be perfect. Anybody there? I will walk before the Lord. I will be perfect. All imperfections will clear out of my life. All corruption will clear out of my life. Walk before me and be thou perfect. First Thessalonians chapter 2. In First Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 10. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we have behaved ourselves among you that believe. And there's something commendable about Paul the Apostle. Paul was called by God. And Paul was called by Christ. And Paul was commissioned by the Holy Ghost. His name came out clearly. Jesus told Ananias and even called Paul by name. Go to him. It's a chosen vessel. And the Holy Ghost spoke out concerning Paul the Apostle. Separate unto me Paul and Barnabas to the work I've committed into their hands. You know what? There are some people, once they know that God has called them, has commissioned them, has even recommended them openly. This is Almighty God doing that. They say, God called me, and everybody knows God called me. And what I am doing, nobody can take my place. Therefore, I can live anyhow I want. That sometimes, that sometimes I need to take some liberty. Liberty to do what I shouldn't do, I know. But nobody can touch me. Already the Almighty God has recommended me before the people. I called him. But you know what? Paul was very different. He will not go down to a low level. A low level of compromise. A low level of sinning. A low level of deception. A low level of a dirty life. Just because everybody knows I'm called and nobody can touch me. But you know what? He said, you are witnesses. I don't take clothes to my hand. You are witnesses and God also. How holily and justly and unblameably we have behaved ourselves among you that believe that is consecration. And many times Paul was in places nobody else was. Sometimes in the prison. And nobody was there to check up on him. But he said God is witness. How holily and unblameably and justly I behaved myself. That man was truly consecrated to walk in newness of life. If you are a true believer, bona fide believer, child of God, anywhere you are, whether people see you or not, whether people will detect any cutting of edges, any compromise or not, you say it doesn't matter. I'm not living the life for them. I'm living the life in faithfulness to God. I will live holy. I will live just. I will live unblameably. Look at verse 11. As you know, how we exhort and comforted and charged every one of you. As a father does his children, that she would walk worthy of God. How? Walk holy, be just, and be unblameable. That she would walk worthy of God. 
who has called you unto his kingdom and glory. I pray that that commitment, that dedication will be in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Point number three now, our crowning for walking in newness of life. We'll be crowned on the final day, commended on the final day, rewarded on the final day because we have been walking consistently, constantly, in a committed way in the newness of life. Rapture will take place and the people that will go are the people that have been walking consistently in the newness of life. Genesis chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 22. Genesis chapter 5, verse 22. And Enoch walked with God. Without compromise, and Enoch walked with God. Without the stain of corruption in the society. And Enoch walked with God without cutting edges. And Enoch walked with God without seeking the commendation of men. And Enoch walked with God without seeking the praise and the approval of men. And Enoch walked with God without giving attention to the fear of man. And Enoch walked with God without any form of unfaithfulness. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. There are some people that say they cannot live in holiness. They cannot walk in holiness because now they are married. Before they were married, when they were all alone, come and see how holy I was. But you know, since I got married and my wife is not giving a past mark to every consecration I'd made before I got married, you know what? I cannot be like I was when I wasn't married. Not Enoch. And Enoch walked with God. He had a wife. We don't even know the name of the wife. He had children, sons and daughters. You know, my daughters and uh, my sons are growing up. And these sons and daughters, one day become teenagers. And you say, don't go there. That's where they go. Stand up. They sit down. Don't move this way. That's why they move. And since I've got sons and daughters, you know, it's becoming more difficult to walk in righteousness and holiness. Not Enoch. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah. And he walked with God 300 years and he begat sons and daughters. Some people say, since I got position in society. You know, it's very difficult now. You have to compromise one way or the other. If you're going to keep your job, if you're going to keep your position, if you're going to keep your prestige, and if you're going to walk with wisdom among those people outside, you have to, you know, forget about holiness once in a while. Not Enoch. He was known in society. And his son, Methuselah, was known in the world at that time. And yet Enoch walked with God. Enoch walked with God. Verse 24. And Enoch walked with God. And he was not. For God took him. For God took him. He did not die. He made the rapture. You'll make the rapture. I said, you'll make the rapture. You will not know about the rapture in vain. You will go when the saints of God go marching in. You'll be among us in Jesus' name. But you know now, it's going to take singling yourself out. 
becoming a man, a saved man, a separated man, a sanctified man, a spirit-filled man, a spirit-controlled man, a single-minded man. You need to separate yourself from every other influence that will not allow your call to the newness of life to shine bright. If you're going to be a woman of God, called, consecrated, committed, concerned, constant, you have to separate yourself. A saved Christian woman a sanctified Christian woman, a separated Christian woman, a set apart Christian woman, a distinct, distinguished Christian woman that others may, I can not, and it doesn't matter, multitudes of women may be going in one direction. If you are the only one standing, standing for righteousness, you will stand, you will not compromise. To make it at the time of the rapture, or if death comes before the rapture, for you to make it to heaven, you have to single out yourself and be a single-minded man, a single-minded woman. Whatever others do, I'm committed to walking in newness of life. Give me a good amen. amen. Psalm 15 from verse 1. Psalm 15 from verse 1. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? That's asking, paraphrase it, summarize it. Bring it to simple terms. We will get to heaven and dwell in heaven. Verse 2. He that walketh uprightly. He that walketh uprightly. It takes walking in this newness of life to get to heaven. He that walketh righteousness. You walk at righteousness. The walk of your hand is righteous. Your system is righteous. The model you follow is righteous. You know, there are people that do the wrong thing in the right way. Other people do the right thing in the wrong way. All those will not make heaven. You have to do the right thing in the right way at the right time. Before you can get to heaven, he that walketh uprightly, not somebody wobbling, not somebody today is up, tomorrow is down, not somebody in the church is loud and clear as to serving God. When he gets to the place of work, he's quiet and compromising. That's not upright. He that walketh uprightly. Somebody who makes a lot of consecration at the time of prayer. And then when he gets to the public in the community, he cannot carry it out. He did not pray for courage along with his conviction. He that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. Speaketh the truth in his heart. Speaketh the truth in his heart. There are many people that hide the truth in the heart. Something has happened. And we're asking, who did that? Look at the man. He knows the truth. Who did it? He hides the truth in the heart. You will not hear from me. Of course, you know, it's not a courageous believer. It's not a man of conviction. It's not a righteous man. It's not a reformer. 
It's not a person that has the boldness that says wrong must be changed. Evil must not triumph. It will not take root in the kingdom of God. And so you ask him, and he says, I don't know. But he knows to get to heaven, you have to bring the truth out of your heart. He speaketh the truth in his heart. Somebody has gone wrong. He's committed sin. He's having a great position in the church. And the Lord is telling him, you don't qualify anymore. What brought you in will keep you in. The righteousness, the faithfulness that brought you in, into the kingdom for such a time as this. Is that righteousness and faithfulness that will keep you in. But now something has happened. And Nathan does not know. And there you are. What are you going to do now? Keep on preaching. Keep on singing. Keep on walking. Keep on ministering. And every time you keep on ministering like that, you know you fail. And you know you committed sin. You are hiding that truth in your heart. You are not speaking it out. If Christ comes at such a time, you would have labored in vain because, Lord, who shall abide in the tabernacle? Or who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue. Get into heaven. No doeth evil to his neighbor to get to heaven. No taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. In whose eyes a vile person is contempt. And he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He honors the people who in all circumstances, at all times, they're earnestly contending for the faith was delivered unto the saints. Fearlessly, faultlessly, faithfully, they're earnestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints. This man, this woman going to heaven, honors them that fear the Lord. He that swear to his own hurt and changes not. He that makes his consecration, and a consecration may be opposed by anyone, but he changes not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor take up, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. I pray you'll get to heaven. I pray I'll get to heaven. I pray that what you have built in years gone by, you will not destroy with a careless hand today in Jesus' name. You will not destroy what you have built. Because of the fear of man seizing your heart, occupying your heart, enslaving your heart, you will not be a slave in Jesus' name. Isaiah chapter 33, verse 15. Isaiah chapter 33, verse 15. He that walketh righteously, this is how to get to heaven, and speaketh uprightly. This how to make it at last. He that despises the gain of oppressions. He that despises the gain of oppressions. There are some people you can't call them believers. You can only call them church men, church women. The church people they are not sincere transparent believers they know that this man is getting his money through blood 
It's not walking. It's not doing anything. But through blood and through whatever means, it's getting millions. And that's the person they will partner with and do business with. They are for business. They are not for heaven. It says, he that despises the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his sand from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing blood, and shutteth his ears from seeing evil. He shall dwell on high. They will get to heaven. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him. His waters shall be sure. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. You'll see the beauty of heaven. And they shall behold the land that is far off. For us to make it on that final day and to be crowned, we have to keep on walking in newness of life until that glorious day. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. I'm reading here from verse 3. Revelation chapter 3. Reading from verse 3. It says, Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast. Remember when you got saved, how you received. Remember how you repented. Remember how you made restitution. Remember how you became righteous. Remember how you were single-minded. Remember how you consecrated your life. Remember how you helped other people, not hindering other people, to hold on to the ancient landmarks. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, and you become careless, carefree, and you destroy the standard you are built in the earlier years, if therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sadis, which have not defiled their garments. They shall walk, that's it, you'll walk with him in light here, you'll walk with him in glory up there. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, I will overcome. Any overcomer there, I said, I will overcome. You will overcome the flesh. You overcome persecution. You overcome ridicule. You overcome the fear of man. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. The Lord is calling us to remember how it was in the good old days. When we hurt, when we held, when we remained in the ancient landmarks, in the word of God, without fear, without favor, without compromise, and without cringing, and we held on to the word of God in the church, in the office, in the market, on the road, in a taxi, in the train, everywhere. Anywhere we were, we held on to this word, the faith, the fullness of faith, once committed unto the saints. And the Lord is saying, if you are thinking of getting to heaven, 
if you are planning to get to heaven, there's only one way. Remember your call, the call to walk in newness of life. Remember your old time consecration, the consecration to walk in newness of life. And remember the consummation of your life, the finality of all sin, our crowning if we walk in newness of life. The Lord is calling us back to the altar and he's saying, let's repair whatever has been scattered and let's bring all our commitment, consecration, determination and diligence back together again and prepare to get to heaven. Any candidate for heaven there? I said any candidate for heaven there? Any candidate for heaven there? Rise up and tell the Lord and recommit your life to the Lord to walk in newness of life. Reposition yourself to walk in newness of life. And reconsecrate your life to walk in newness of life. All the compromises that have come in. All the deception that has come in and all the hypocrisy that has come in, all the deception that has come in, the Lord is saying, come back to the altar. Come back to the altar. All the destruction of the old landmark of repentance, of restitution, of righteousness, all the compromises that have come in, Come back to the altar and repair that altar and recommit, reconsecrate yourself to the Lord and say, Lord, I, from today, will walk in newness of life. Brethren, we have been brought to the cleaner's house. We have been brought to the dry cleaner this morning. You have been brought before the Lord to be dry cleaned as you examine yourself, as I examine myself. In the line of the word of God we have heard, you discover we have been brought before the Lord so that we can be dry cleaned. We have patches here, patches there, patches over there, but the Lord is telling us today You need the resurrection power to walk with the Lord. Why not pray? Why not talk to the Lord? Heaven is the goal. Heaven and the sky is the goal. Are you sure you are ready? Are you sure you are prepared? My brother, my sister, the Lord is calling this money and is asking you, do you need the power and the resurrection power to walk with him? You have been walking on your own. You have been traveling on your own. No strength, no energy. But today, this money this hour, the resurrection power is calling upon you, walking to the lift of the Lord. When you walk into the lift, you will not spend any effort, you will not spend any energy. The lift will take you up, and that's the resurrection power. My brother, my sister, this is a serious moment, a time of decision, the hour of decision. The Lord is asking you, all the things you have destroyed at the point of conversion, 
at the point of regeneration, at the point you take a decision, at the point you said, this day, this hour, I am giving my life to you. And you renounce, and you gave up, and you surrendered. Are those things coming back again? That's why you need the cleansing power of the Almighty God this morning. 